All right. Greetings, everyone. My name is Matthew Homiak, and I am the NR's lead, NRC's lead for the Extremely Low Probability of Rupture, or XLPR, Probabilistic Fracture Mechanics Program. This is a joint venture between the NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research and the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI. Today, I'm joined by my counterpart from EPRI, Craig Harrington, NRC and EPRI Management, and also some key contributors to the program from the NRC, EPRI, and some of our technical support contractors. On behalf of every, everyone, I'm very pleased to have you all here today for our XLPR code pre-release event. The purpose of the meeting today is to present to you the XLPR version 2 probabilistic fracture mechanics code and provide information on how you will soon be able to request a copy. This is an NRC Category 3 public meeting. That means the public is invited to participate by providing comments and asking questions throughout. Today, we're using the WebEx platform to deliver this meeting. We have demonstrations and other dynamic content, so I would encourage everyone to participate through the WebEx application. You'll get the best experience that way. In WebEx, you can submit your questions and comments at any time in the chat window. If you don't see that on your display, hover over the bottom middle of the main WebEx display screen and click on the comment balloon icon. There you should see the option to send message to all panelists, and that should be the default. At certain points, we may also open up the phone line to take questions and comments orally. After the meeting ends, we will issue a summary, which will be available on NRC's public website. And any questions that we weren't able to get to today, we will respond to in the summary. And we're also recording the meeting for later viewing. So that covers my administrative items for the meeting today. And now on to a brief overview of our agenda. Here's a copy of our agenda today. We're currently in the introduction and opening remarks portion. Following that, we'll cover the XLPR program history and some perspectives. Then I'll provide an overview of the code itself and some of the features it has. And we have an excellent demonstration for you on the code itself and some applications present and planned. Craig will provide an overview of the process for requesting a copy of the code. And we'll also announce some opportunities for future training webinars that we have planned. We'll follow that with opportunity for general questions and answers, and then closing marks, and we will adjourn. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Louise Lund and Kurt Edsinger to provide a few opening remarks from NRC and EPRI management. Louise is the Director of the Division of Engineering in NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research, and Kurt is the Director of Research and Development Materials and Advanced Nuclear at EPRI. With that, Louise, would you care to kick it off? Yes, thank you. Welcome, everyone. This is quite the virtual audience. Some of you may have followed the XLPR journey for years, while others only more recently. The fact is that today marks a significant milestone in that journey where the fruits of our labor will be made available to regulators, industry, and researchers across the globe. From the NRC's perspective, XLPR version 2 fills a long-standing need to have a technically vetted probabilistic fracture mechanics code for piping integrity risk assessment. Also, NRC is currently embracing transformation to realize the staff's vision of a form regulator. Although XLPR wasn't conceived with that specific vision in mind, it's already well positioned to support both aspects of it. We consider XLPR to be one of our flagship safety codes at the NRC, and today you will hear from NRC staff and the U.S. nuclear industry experts why that is. First and foremost, and I think my counterpart, Kurt, will agree. Much of XLPR's value lies in the effective technical working relationships built over years among the NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research staff, EPRI, and their contractors. 
some 80 experts were involved in the making of the XLPR version two. But it wasn't enough to bring the best and brightest to the development of this code. We also built XLPR using modern software design concepts under the framework of a robust quality assurance program. Extensive verification and validation activities were central to this effort. Finally, we built XLPR to be flexible and transparent. As you'll soon see, flexibility is maximized through a modular design, customizable inputs, and the ability to extract a wide range of information for specific applications. As to transparency, the technical basis has been extensively documented and vetted, and many of the algorithms can be readily inspected. XLPR is certainly no black box. NRC and EPRI have developed the code, and our intent all along was to share it. I'm pleased to see us at that point today. Our hope is that many of you will go on to become active users and contributors to its further development, thereby maximizing the benefit to all. With that, I would like to give Kurt the opportunity to provide some of EPRI's perspectives. Thanks, Luis, and good morning. The XLPR probabilistic fracture mechanics code has been developed by the USNRC and EPRI, as Luis noted, to quantitatively evaluate piping rupture events. With a primary impetus on resolving leak before break and implications of primary water stress corrosion cracking, but always with an eye to many other possible applications. I, I agree with Luis, we've produced a tool that both industry and NRC understand and have confidence in, and that enables its usefulness in a range of applications. And the first application to leak before break, LBB and PWSCC is now underway. So today marks an important day. A large number of people will now have access to a tool to evaluate active degradation mechanisms and quantify the implications for a range of things that have up to now been assumptions. This has been a lot of years in the making. One of the things I'm most excited about seeing is what questions the new users are going to address. Questions that we may not have even have thought of as being answered by this tool. So my sincere thanks to the team for all the hard work that went into this, and I look forward to the seminar today. And maybe Matt, back to you. Yes, thank you, Kurt and Louise, for those opening remarks. Okay, uh, now on to the uh, business portion of our agenda here, and uh, I'll have Craig lead us off on the next topic here, which is just to provide a brief history of the XLPR program, and supporting him will be some additional perspectives from Dr. David Rudlin. Dave is the Senior Technical Advisor for Steam Generators Integrity and Materials Inspection in the Division of New and Renewed Licenses in NRC's Office of Nuclear Reactor Regulation. He is also my predecessor as NRC's XLPR program lead. And we also have uh, Dr. Robert Treganing. He's a senior level advisor for materials engineering issues, in the Division of Engineering, NRC Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research. Greg? Well, good morning. Uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share a bit of uh, XLPR uh, history and, and our, uh, our progress with you. The, the XLPR story began in late 2007 in the office, uh, NRC Office of Research with Mr. Bob Hardy's and uh, Mr. Al Santos. Al and Bob were both actively involved with and were strong proponents of probabilistic applications within regulatory matters. 
and particularly with probabilistic fraction mechanics. PFM computational tools tend to be component and problem specific. But Bob and Al recognized that the underlying fraction mechanics was really agnostic to such differences, even as materials, the loads and stresses, the configuration complexities varied. They proposed development of a common flexible PFM platform with a modular structure to efficiently accommodate a, a wide range of pressure boundary integrity problems and components uh, of various configurations that could be addressed by adding new modules. Jennifer Ewell provided management support to pursue this idea, which formally launched what became XLPR. The initial focus was piping, and specifically the leak before break issues associated with primary water stress corrosion cracking in dissimilar metal welds. To make this ambitious, to tackle this ambitious scope, NRC partnered with EPRI to share resources and funding, but more importantly, to combine the depth of technical knowledge that both organizations could bring to bear on the project. A series of planning meetings took place over the course of 2008 but they seemingly identified more questions than answers, and the team ultimately decided that undertaking a pilot study was the essential first step. To answer in particular the three most critical questions that we identified of, is the overall goal realistically attainable? What would be the best computational approach and platform to use? And can NRC and EPRI successfully collaborate in this way? To investigate the computational platform issue, the pilot study developed two competing limited scope codes employing a common set of physical model modules to carry the theme of a modular approach in one of these, the integration framework was programmed as a standalone software product, while the other was developed within a commercially available simulation modeling environment. Building on successful completion of the pilot study and incorporating a number of lessons learned from that part of the project, we launched development and production version of XLPR in 2007. Consistent with the original idea and the pilot study, key goals were to ensure the final product was well vetted, appropriately represented the diversity of current knowledge in the relevant technical areas, and that it employed a distributed development approach we wanted in particular to avoid an insular outcome and over-reliance on a small set of developers. To this end, as is shown on the screen, the project team involved on the order of 80 subject matter experts from NRC, EPRI, three national labs, and seven commercial companies. While not always efficient, this large team and the diversity that it reflected was critical to ensure that the endless number of small and large technical decisions involved in, in this type of a project were thoroughly considered and the decision basis in each case was technically sound. NRC and EPRI provided joint management and oversight of the project throughout. We established a virtual organization that was co-funded in roughly equal shares without commingling funds between the organizations. And this is the same way we managed the uh, pilot study as well. NRC and EPRI separately funded and independently contributed staff 
to this project team and the leadership roles within each of the different uh, component elements shown on the, the slide were carefully balanced between NRC and EPRI contributors. We employed a collegial approach uh, for decisions on all technical matters and almost all decisions were made by consensus. While a process was in place to address differences in professional opinion, uh, it was never exercised. We incorporated the intent of an Appendix B QA program for software development from the inception to both ensure a well-documented, high-quality outcome and to facilitate future use of the code by industry for licensing submittals and Appendix B. We incorporated program audits as well as both internal and external oversight groups to build additional confidence in our developmental process and in the final product. XLPR V2.1 is the first step toward that goal of a generic probabilistic fracture mechanics tool for evaluating degradation of pressure boundary components. Although presently limited to piping configurations, it has set a very high bar in terms of flexibility and the range of options available to the user to consider almost any variable as distributed and to tailor its application to a diverse set of problems. However, to accomplish this degree of flexibility, we have also challenged some of the capabilities of the underlying platform. So as with most new computational tools, uh, we do have early opportunities for continued improvement. One final point is worth mentioning. Uh, many of you have been wondering if we were ever going to release this code. Much of the recent delay has been an unfortunate artifact of our early singular focus on those technical goals of the project, and frankly, a lack of perspective amongst the team for the legal issues involved in commingled intellectual property rights in a living software product held between two very different organizations. We are extremely glad at this point to reach this milestone where those issues have been sorted out, and we're excited to now share this tool with the broader technical community. I'd like to shift now to just some, some brief perspectives on, on the project, uh, and it, it has been my privilege to manage EPRI's participation in this project and to work closely with my NRC counterpart and this uh, team of subject matter experts. Uh, they have no idea how much I have learned from, from working with them. As noted in the opening remarks by Louise, uh, a long-lasting hidden legacy of this project will be that regulatory and industry representatives alike gained a greater appreciation and understanding of differing perspectives across the range of technical issues addressed over the course of our work. I'm convinced that such improved understanding benefits all participants and will pay dividends for years to come. PFM analyses and the underlying computational tools are complex. When applied in a regulatory setting, it is incumbent on the regulator to not only assess the analytical outcome, but to also understand how that outcome was obtained. With PFM applications, this can often shift the applicant's emphasis away from the analysis to focus on explaining and defending the computational tool. And this can become an impediment to acceptance of the actual application itself. Somewhat similar to the status of the favor code, the depth of knowledge of the basis and the inner workings of XLPR 
presently held by NRC, holds the promise that greater focus by both the applicants and the regulator can be placed on how the code might be used instead of just trying to understand how the code itself works. With that, I will hand it to Dave Rutland for uh, perspectives from the NRC staff. Thanks, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, this is Dave Rudlin. Um, you know, I, I have to uh, say that I, I share a lot of, uh, of Craig's uh, perspectives, and, and I thank him uh, for uh, the times that we've spent together over the years uh, trying to uh, get this code uh, uh, completed and released. You know, I've been uh, I've been with the agency now uh, about 12 years, and XLPR was one of the first programs that I worked on when I started at the agency. And, and while the, uh, the development of the code was not always smooth or easy, um, it was uh, by far the most collegial, uh, cooperative, and, and honestly, technically exciting programs that I've worked on uh, since I've been at the agency. Uh, personally, I wanna, I wanna thank uh, both the NRC and every teams uh, for for working together and, and and working together in such a in such a professional way and in, in the development of a very technically challenging uh, a piece of software and technology. Um, as we move forward, I, I really look forward to um, experiencing how we how we use this code uh, not only in research space but also in regulatory space. And uh, and I of course will look forward to how how the code evolves and how our use uh, evolves of that code. So again, thank. I just want to personally, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for all the hard work, and I'm I'm glad that we uh, that we made it to this to this point. So I guess I'll turn it over to Rob for a couple of comments. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I appreciate uh, the remarks that. Uh, both you and Craig made, and I certainly echo those remarks. Uh, to me, the, the excitement and, the, and, and everything that we plan for with XLPR is really coming to fruition today and hopefully into the future because, you know, NRC and EPRI have both been, uh, over our histories, we've developed a lot of code. So the fact that, we've, that we developed a new code, there's nothing unique about that. But I think what is unique is we always develop this particular code with an eye to the future. And some of the unique things that Craig already touched on that I'm hoping will bear fruits in, uh, for us in the future is the extensive documentation that we did up front. The fact that we relied on a wide, broad, distributed array of experts instead of just a few subject matter experts in a particular specialty. And again, the fact that we did extensive uh, quality assurance measures and uh, verification and validation efforts up front. So I hope when other users uh, get this code, all this groundwork that we've provided will provide a, a really good platform and basis for future and ongoing development of this code. Because I think we all know uh, Software codes are living organisms, and if they don't continue to be used and develop and evolve, then they will eventually die and not be used. So I think uh, given that we've all put this work in, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that its future will be established. And, and I, I believe, and, and, and I think this will be borne out, that the work that Craig and Dave and all the technical contributors have made have have provided us with a good framework for you know future development and use of this particular code. So with that, I will turn it back over to Matt Homiak. Great, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, was there any questions anyone has uh, for Craig, Dave, or Rob? If so, you could please submit them through the chat. Okay, we'll see if uh, some other questions trickle in. We're just getting started here.
All right. Um, I'll lead us into the next topic here, which is an overview of the code itself and some of the features it has. So XLP, of course, is a probabilistic fracture mechanics tool for nuclear power plant piping integrity risk analysis. And as you've heard, it's, it's a joint effort between the NRC's Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research and the Electric Power Research Institute, now in its second version. Uh, XLPR is capable of modeling uh, degradation mechanisms such as stress corrosion cracking, uh, the model crack initiation, uh, residual stress effects, and well as uh, a variety of uh, mitigations to combat uh, stress corrosion cracking, for example. Um, and NRC and EPRI staff have been using XLPR to uh, risk inform emerging piping integrity issues using probabilistic approaches. So XLPR is a probabilistic fracture mechanics code. So what does that mean exactly? We'll take a look at a example uh, structural integrity problem and illustrate the differences between deterministic and probabilistic fracture mechanics. So uh, in assessing the integrity of a particular component, we look at the stress, consider material properties such as toughness, and perhaps the crack growth, and a, a crack size, and that will give us a, an estimate of the life of the particular component. Now, looking at the uh, deterministic approach, uh, what we'd probably do is take a conservatively high value for the stress, conservatively low value for the toughness, and a conservatively high, conservatively high value for the crack growth. And then we might also put on uh, a large crack size. And so our prediction of life using that approach would be based on a single calculation plus margin, giving us a conservative result. Now comp contrast that with the probabilistic approach. And then sample many values of stress, many values of, of toughness from probability distributions, as well as crack growth and different crack sizes as well. We're going to aggregate multiple calculations, give us a probability of failure over time. So two different approaches. The probabilistic approach is giving us much better insight into the actual life of that component with much more data. Let's take a look at how uh, pipe is represented in XLPR. We have uh, basically a, a configuration of a butt weld and three main components, which we call an XLPR left pipe, right pipe, and weld. Here the weld is shown in the red. And we can assign different material properties to all those components. Um, and that would allow us to model uh, a similar metal weld or a dissimilar metal weld in the case of a nickel alloy. In XLPR, we can model uh, two main degradation mechanisms, stress corrosion cracking and fatigue. Uh, we can model the effects of both of those at the same time. Uh, we, we can model crack initiation from both those mechanisms, or we can seed initial flaws. And we can also model crack growth as well. A crack model in XLPR includes uh, two, two different planar orientations, circumferential and, and axial, and we can consider multiple cracks around the circumference of the pipe. And XLPR's uh, core business is really to model the crack life cycle. We do that with surface cracks, which grow into transitioning through wall cracks. Those are cracks that could leak and, and potentially rupture. And then further growth would lead to an idealized through wall crack, also leaking and would have the potential to rupture as well. Um, we can also model 
how the plant operates over time. Uh, we can do that with the different operating conditions, uh, be it pressures, temperatures, stresses. Uh, we can also model different chemical species in the water chemistry. And we can also model different types of mitigation as well. And so XLPR would be taking all those things into account and uh, splitting up the operating history of the plant um, as shown in the, the chart here, uh, you know, based on several different time, time intervals on, on all the activities that might happen in the simulation. So for mitigation, we have a couple different types we can, we can model. And these are based on uh, approaches that are currently being used in, in industry. We can model inlays, which is, uh, a, for example, a PWSCC resistant material on the inside of the weld, shown in purple here. We can also model overlays. That would be, again, a PWSCC uh, resistant material on the applied to the outside of the pipe. Uh, we can also model a uh, mechanical stress improvement process that actually squeezes the pipe and uh, puts it in compression on the inside diameter. Uh, so those are all different ways that we can uh, slow the initiation and, and crack crack growth. Um, we can also do that with uh, uh, different kinds of water chemistry as well. So we can simulate uh, hydrogen, how it affects crack growth, zinc, how it would affect crack initiation, or both of those. We can detect cracks in, in two ways in XLPR. Uh, through in-service inspection modeling, primarily ultrasonic testing, and as well as uh, through, through leak rate detection. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit about um, the main features that XLPR has in the models. I want to talk a little bit about how XLPR is actually designed now, the actual structure of the architecture of the code. So we start with a, a framework. And this is what's going to take all the user inputs. Uh, it's built in the commercial GoldSim Monte Carlo simulation engine. And this is going to control the simulation. Uh, it's going to step the different trials through time. And it's going to aggregate all the results at the end and show them to the user. And built around the framework, we have a variety of deterministic modules that um, model the various physical processes. These are all coded in Fortran, um, and, and it proceeds basically through the uh, evolution of the crack life cycle. Essentially, we'll start uh, with initiation, and then going clockwise, move on to growth. Uh, in the case of cert cracks, we would model the uh, combination of the two together uh, using coalescence module. We can then model the transition um, do a through wall crack using the transition module, uh, all along assessing the stability of the cracks using a variety of stability modules. We have a crack opening displacement module to determine how uh, far open the crack is. And that's used in uh, helping us calculate our, our leak rates. And then finally, we have uh, in service inspection, which is used to detect uh, cracks that may be there. Um, throughout the, the simulation. So combining it all together here with the framework, essentially you see how it, it works is that um, the framework would be calling one of these, any one of these modules, and then uh, the module will do its respective calculations, pass the information back to the framework uh, for record keeping purposes, and then the framework would advance uh, to the next module as appropriate. So that's just a brief overview of how the code is actually structured. I will talk a little bit about uh, how the code handles uh, uncertainties. XLPR has a dual loop sampling structure. So uncertain variables can either be assigned to an al aleatory loop or an epistemic loop. And you might assign an aleatory loop to an uncertain variable um, if it was the uncertainty was just due to natural variation. Uh, epistemic would be due to lack of knowledge. And this is very useful if you're trying to understand which of the many uh, input uncertainties might need to be reduced. XLPR supports a br uh, broad range of uh, 
probability distributions. Uh, some examples uh, on the slide here. Um, these are the typical ones we use, normal, log normal, uniform, discrete, and, and Weibull. Uh, XLPR sampling algorithms for doing the Monte Carlo simulation have several. Uh, simple random sampling, of course, uh, but we also have more advanced sampling options such as Latin hypercube sampling, discrete probability distribution, and important sampling. Those advanced sampling options are there um, to basically make the simulation more efficient as compared to simple random sampling. So here's an illustration of what, what output from the code uh, might look like. And like I said earlier, we're looking at uh, some kind of metric over time. So the, the main ones would be uh, crack, leak, and rupture. And we're seeing some results here from the code. So while all these uh, gray lines are showing you an individual trial or realization. And so we can see here that you know your results could be as bad as the, the gray line on the very top of the plot. Um, but most are, are down on, on the lower region. And then we can take uh, statistics of those uh, individual realizations as well um, to, to draw conclusions about the system. Uh, crack, leak, and rupture probabilities are, are the main ones, but there are many other uh, outputs from the code too, such as uh, local frequencies and things like that. Okay, so uh, we have talked a little bit about XLPR and it's built under a quality assurance program. What was that exactly? Uh, it was select elements from the ASME NQA1 2008 and 2009 uh, standards. Uh, those are NRC endorsed ways for meeting NRC zone 10 CFR Part 50 Appendix B quality assurance requirements. Uh, and then on top of that, we also followed uh, international software engineering standards uh, from IEEE, we use those as guidance to in, in the quality assurance program as well. XLPR has extensive tech, technical documentation, uh, software requirements, software design, testing, test plans, and, and test results uh, for, for every module in the framework, and then everything together as well. We verified and validated XLPR extensively. Uh, for ver in, in difference there, of course, is Verification is just making sure that you uh, fulfilled all your requirements, whereas validation would be making sure that you're actually getting the result that you think you should. Uh, over 4,000 verification tests were performed. That was quite an effort that we were all involved with. Um, and we validated XLPR uh, each physical model by itself, so all those modules that I showed you earlier, and then also the uh, all the models integrated together integrated together. With the framework, we validate against uh, operating experience, finite element simulations, and benchmarked against other probabilistic fracture mechanics codes. We also had XLPR uh, reviewed externally. Uh, we had a, what we called the external review board, which was a panel of international experts that uh, assessed uh, key aspects of XLPR during the development process. So uh, just uh, I'd like to conclude here with a short summary of some of the capabilities that XLPR has. Like I said, it can model stress corrosion cracking, thermal mechanical fatigue. We can model crack initiation uh, from both those degradation mechanisms. We have ways to count for aleatory and epistemic uncertainties, perform leak rate calculations. We can consider residual stress effects in in, in the simulation as well, both before and after mitigation. We simulate water chemistry impacts, the effects of ultrasonic inspections. Uh, we can also model uh, the effects of the increased stresses from earthquakes in a probabilistic way, as well as a variety of uh, stress material mit mitigation techniques, such as inlays, onlays, and overlays. All right, so that concludes my
presentation here on some of the features and XLPR and this is not to get into the details of any of these really but just to provide an overview of of what's in the code we'll uh, cover a little bit later um, some opportunities we'll have to do some more technical discussion on the, the features of the code so let's see I think we have uh, a little bit ahead of schedule here, so we'll see if we can entertain some questions. Matt, there's been an active uh, set of questions coming in. We're trying to respond to them as quickly as we can. Is there any you want me to try to field right now? Yeah. This is Dave Rodman. They're coming in very, very quickly, and we can't uh, answer them as quickly as they're coming in. So I, I don't know how we want to try to handle this. Yeah, let me. Um, of course, I haven't been seeing any of them during my presentation here. Let me see if I can catch up a bit. But uh, Dave, you know, Craig, if you wanted to field any that you might be a little head on, please. Please go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm trying to read through them as quickly as I can. Let's see, here's a question that says, uh, regarding the in-service inspection input parameter, POD curves input as a distribution, we, uh, Yes, you have you have uh, curves that can be used. You can provide your own curves. There is sampling uh, applied to the POD uh, inputs, so there, there is great flexibility there as well. Um, Yeah, this is Dave. There's been several questions about SEC and fatigue uh, growth, and uh, the, the two phenomena are calculated separately each time step, and the contributions are added together. I think I may have said that in the in the comments, but there were other questions about it, so I just wanted to make that comment uh, verbally. Okay. We also had uh, someone asking about multiple cracks in the proximity rules um, and whether those Proximity rules were applied conservatively, for example, high, moderate, or low. Uh, and the answer to okay. that is the user has the flexibility to determine those um, those coalescence rules. Actually, so you can you can you know pick a best estimate, um, or you can you can skew it either high or low if you need wanted to, depending on what you're trying to do. Matt, there's a question on slide 12. It says, what is the definition of crack probability and leak probability on that slide? This is slide 12 here. Definitions of crack probability and leak probability. Uh, so at least on the example here, we're looking at probability of a crack. So that would be. Um, you know, using the initiation models, um, you know, whether or not you, those models predicted the, the pipe to have a crack or not. And so initiation isn't generally not very likely. Um, so we're seeing most of the results there down in the lower orders of probability. Um, you know, which, whereas at the top you have 1.0, that would be a, of course, 100% chance of having a crack. And, and the, in this particular slide, uh, one of the key points of XLPR is it, it does generate some specific pre, uh, you know, sort of canned results, but the data behind those results is accessible to the user, and that allows you to develop many different uh, results. So the 
the definition in many respects would be whatever you want it to be in terms of how you process the data. So uh, it doesn't, the code doesn't just generate a few answers and that's all you get. There's, a, there's great flexibility to the user in, in um, how to pursue the process. Right, there's there's several there's several questions about uh, materials uh, and uh, circ and axial flaws. Uh, let me start with the circ and axial flaws. Uh, both uh, circumferential and axial flaws are modeled uh, uh, in a any one analysis. However, they they do not interact. Uh, what I mean by that is that the flaws uh, the circ and axial flaws do not interact with each other. Uh, they both may influence the uh, the probability of leak or rupture, but they don't uh, react with each other. Uh, in terms of materials, uh, the input deck for XLPR is very flexible to put in whatever material properties that you'd like. Um, however, if there is special uh, um, uh, special material laws or or special growth uh, laws that aren't uh, uh, that aren't standard, then those aren't uh, available right now in XLPR. There's a question that says, would it also be possible to access the results from different steps of the calculations? For example, results from just the stability module or transition module. Uh, and that's, that's uh, one of the tremendous benefits. It's also computationally and, and memory-wise challenging, this code does accumulate all of that data. And as, as will be uh, briefly uh, mentioned and demonstrated in the next section of the agenda, uh, you can reach in and grab that data to go calculate the additional results that may be important to your analysis. So the, the basic answer is yes. Uh, there was another question about proximity, uh, and they want to know if the ASME rules are programmed in an XLPR. And I think it was Matt that mentioned about the flexibility, um, and I, I believe you can use that flexibility to mimic the ASME proximity rules. Uh, it is not an option where you select a button and it becomes the ASME proximity rules, but the flexibility allows you to put in uh, you know, the, the distance between the cracks so, and where they interact, so you can mimic the uh, proximity rules in ASME. There's a question that says, is each user supposed to perform case-specific validation of the code, or as long as the code is used within the applicable range of input parameters, the user can assume the code is validated? Uh, that's a, a bit of a more complicated question. But uh, fundamentally, we, we have extensive documentation of the, the range of validation that currently exists for XLPR from our development code. And it would certainly be incumbent upon the, the user of the code to either ensure that and, and be able to demonstrate that you are applying it within that range of validation. And if for some reason your application goes beyond that, then it would be incumbent on the user to address that difference. Had another question here about the crack shape. Um, does the user need to assume a shape in the orientation first? Um, and the answer is that the user can um, can set the crack shape. Actually, uh, you know, the aspect ratio that, that's an input that the user uh, can control essentially. Um, and and that's whether the crack is set up as an initial flaw or whether you know the size of the crack that's initiated uh, after some period of time by the initiation module. So uh, I think some questions here I've been seeing like you know about inputs and things like that. And, and usually the answer in XLPR is uh, can I change it? And the answer is yes. The the inputs for the large part um, are completely controlled by the user, and they're easy to change. There's a question. Oh, go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. Dave. All right. There's a question about 
um, the changing the changes of the stresses due to a change in flexibility of the piping. Um, and there was a lot of discussion technically about that. What the code does do it it allows you to put in a a factor of of uh, the amount that uh, the thermal stresses would be reduced due to a um, uh, due to a crack. Uh, however, it doesn't give however the code or the uh, manual doesn't give any guidance exactly what number to pick. It, it leaves up to the user to determine how much of that particular load is of the uh, displacement control loads are shed. So the flexibility is, the flexibility is there, but the user needs to, to to know something about their piping system before they can decide what uh, what factor to use. A question about the non-U.S. materials, such as VDR reactor type steels, and again, as, as Dave indicated, there's tremendous flexibility to put your own information in. Uh, however, you, you also have to consider what are the degradation mechanisms that you're concerned about and be sure that you know, it primarily addresses now fatigue and PWSCC, and so you would have to understand those materials in the context of those degradation mechanisms. Uh, and there's also a question about uh, changes in toughness over time, thermal aging or radiation. Uh, there, that, that is not explicitly addressed presently in XLPR. There, there are maybe some some tricks and ways that, that you could uh, trick the code into addressing that to a limited degree, but it is one of the things that we have uh, have noted might be of use to add to the code. Um, there's a question about crack opening time. Um, and uh, so the so the code works such that uh, it, it calculates the crack opening uh, displacement at every time step. And so there are uh, uh, different uh, modeling assumptions for the for the flaws as they transition from a surface crack to a through wall crack, and the crack opening displacement is calculated at every at every time during that transition. That's a tremendous benefit of XLPR as opposed to deterministic analyses. You know, time is considered. We look at the life cycle of a crack from initiation to uh, an ultimate failure and, and all points in between, and that data is available to reach into the, to the uh, results and, and uh, extract for whatever analyses you might want to use, uh, apply it to. There's another question. Can the tool be used on pipe-like vessel internal components, for example, core spray, jet pump risers? Um, and the answer is if you can resolve your problem into the basic uh, butt weld geometry that I showed in the beginning of the presentation, then you can use XLPR to do that. Another question, is a sample problem available? And the answer is yes. In the user's manual, there's uh, some sample problems that the user can, can work through to get acquainted with the software. And uh, we'll also be providing some additional training along with the, the code when we distribute it uh, that will have even more sample problems to, to work through as well. There's a question about PWSEC versus IGSEC, and, and yeah, the code was originally uh, mainly uh, uh, centered around uh, PWSEC since since the, the thought was uh, the LBB issues in, in PWRs. However, the the um, crack growth models are generic enough that one could uh, 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 um, use IGSEC models if uh, uh, if the parameters are appropriate. There's a comment, uh, you compared the deterministic and probabilistic approach with failure probability would you typically associate with deterministic approaches in common codes like ASME, Section 11? That's probably 
too complicated a question to get into here, but uh, I don't know, Dave, unless you have some some thoughts. But I'm sorry, Craig, I was reading another question. Which one were you working on? It says, uh, you compared the deterministic and probabilistic approach. What failure probability would you typically associate with deterministic approaches in common codes like section 11? Oh, that, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a tough, that's a tough question. Whenever you use safety factors and bounding cases, you're, you know, you're pushing yourself to the, to the almost unrealistic limits, right? So I, that, that's a hard question to answer. Does XLPR handle embedded flaws that can grow and transition into a surface flaw? Uh, I think the fundamental answer is no, we did not build embedded flaws into this. Uh, I don't know, Dave, if you have any additional thoughts there. But. Nope, you are correct. I have a uh, question on verification tests, and they said, how did you perform 4,000 verification tests? <laughs> um, so the verification tests were against the requirements that were set out for the software at the beginning of development. And so if there was a, a requirement it needed to be tested, some of those requirements were tested statically, where, for example, you might have just examined the source code to, to make sure the particular element was there. Uh, other verification tests were done dynamically, which would have involved actually running the code and um, looking at the results and making sure that they were meeting the acceptance criteria. Um, how did we do it? We had uh, a bunch of people involved um, to, to run those tests and, and make sure everything was working properly. There's a question about normal operation versus uh, uh, faulted conditions. Uh, the code allows you to put in a normal operation that allows you to put in transients that can uh, uh, mimic fault conditions, and it also uh, has the ability to uh, put in your earthquake loading with the uh, probability of occurrence on the earthquakes. Here, Dave, this is a good one for you. Does XLPR account for how the moments change in the pipe system with the change in flexibility of the piping, or just yeah. use the uncracked? Yeah, I tried. I tried to. I, tried, I think I tried to address that one earlier. Like I okay, mentioned, okay, I missed it. A factor that that can be put on the loads to account for the reduction in the displacement controlled loads. Uh, however, the code doesn't give any particular guidance on what value to choose. Uh, it's up to the user to choose that number based on their piping system. Yeah, I apologize if we're not getting to all these questions. I'm trying to read them as fast as possible, but there are an awful, awful lot of questions coming in. Yeah, I just responded in the chat. Also, we will, uh, any questions that we didn't get to today, uh, we will go ahead and, and respond to in the NRC meeting summary that we put out afterwards. Um, we are winding down on the time for this particular topic, so I'd like to go ahead and move on. We'll circle back uh, at the end of the meeting if we have more time here. Uh, so our next two uh, agenda topics we'll treat in a combined way. This is going to involve an actual demonstration of the code itself, um, and as well as some discussion about the different applications of the code. And supporting those two topics, we have Dr. Cedric Salaberry. He's a mathematician at Engineering Mechanics Corporation of Columbus. He's been involved with XLPR since the beginning with, with version 1. He was part of the team responsible for developing the computational framework. He's a great resource to have, and he's the one who trained me on how to use the code. Uh, we also have Marcus Burkhart. He's a senior engineer at Dominion, Dominion Engineering. He supported a wide range of areas in both XLPR development and applications on the Upper East Side. In addition, I'm joined by Nathan Glunt. He's a senior technical leader in the EPRI Materials Reliability Program. There, his focus is on applications of the code beyond leak before break. All right, thank you gentlemen for being here today. Uh, Cedric, would you please take it away? Thank you. Let me share the different things. Start.
So now we move to a different topic which uh, will demonstrate how the code works and we will uh, list some of the potential application of uh, Excel PR. Uh, one important point is this is a demonstration, this is not a tutorial. So there are many, many things that we won't cover with this demonstration. What we plan to show you is uh, how we set up the input via the Excel file, which will be the most direct version once you're familiar with the code, or the SIM editor, which is an addendum, kind of a wrapper around Excel that simplifies when you first start with uh, Excel PR. Once we have been through set up a problem, we will show how to use GoldSIM to run the code. And for this, we'll use a player, which is a free version of GoldSIM. And finally, we'll present results uh, from an already run case, so you can see which outputs are available by default and how to access other kind of output. And we will illustrate this with an application for leak before break or LBD problem. So the problem we'll look is this one, which looks at primary water stress corrosion cracking, so PWS issues for a reactor vessel outlet nozzle on a generic Westinghouse four loop pressurized water reactor. This is a generic case, so we don't represent a specific uh, power plant. We have used average or representative value uh, to cover any kind of plant from this category. In the screen, you can see the um, global geometry. Uh, the LVON we consider is a 34 inches uh, pipe, and the thickness is around 2.6 inches. The operating condition we consider uh, the temperature is around 320 degrees C, and the pressure is a little shy of 50.5 megapascal. And the simulation time we'll do is for 80 years with a one month time step, which represents about 960 time step total. And in this analysis, we look at the impact of in service inspection and mechanical stress improvement process, which is one of our uh, mitigation cases. So now I will move to the Excel file. In Excel PR, when you want to modify something, all these inputs, you will do it from the Excel file. The Excel file is your input set, and the Excel file we'll use will always have the same name that you can see on the top here. It's Excel PR-2.1 input set dot Excel SX. The data in the Excel file is separated into different tabs. And I will go through the tab now. The first tab, the one on the form of plate, is the user option. So the user option is how you set up your problem. It's mostly a, a series of on-off switch where you decide what you want to do with the analysis. Do you want mitigation or not? Do you want to consider axial, circumferential crack, boss, so, for instance, this one lets you decide which kind of direction you're interested in, and so on. You can select the mitigation, you can select the type of load of stress you use, you can define your transient, and so on. When you move next, you will have the properties. So now we talk about the inputs of the model, and all of these inputs can be both constant or distribution. This will cover uh, the pipe geometry, it will cover the flow size, depending on if you have um, a flow due to fatigue, uh, PWC, SEC, or an initial flow. You will have the operating condition and so on. Next to the property, you will have four tabs. Left pipe, right pipe, weld, and mitigation. All of them cover the material property. So this is where you will define the material property for your left pipe, your right pipe, the weld, and if you consider inlay or overlay, the mitigation material you use for inlay and overlay. This one will be equivalent to the property, except we cover the material properties such as yield strength, ultimate strength, and so on. Finally, here we have the WRS, weld residual stress, which defines the OOP 
well residual stress for the axial crack and the axial well residual stress for the sub crack. It's slightly different from the other because the WRS is represented as a function through the thickness of the pipe, so it's a profile. This profile can be constant or it can be also inserted with a distribution, and in this sense, uh, the distribution will be only normal. And finally, the last part the user can change is if you want to have fatigue in your problem, you can define your transient. So the first step is here. You can define up to 20 transients where you can uh, set the variation in temperature and pressure over time. And in the second tab for type 1, type 1 and 2, type 3 transients, you can define the properties of your transients. When it starts here in this column, when it ends, the frequency, how many uh, events you have per year, and every time you have an event, how many cycles you have. So these are the basic tab the user can change when it sets up the problem he's interested in. You have three more tabs here that I will cover uh, just a little later. These are informative tabs. They are not changed by the user, but they give you additional information when you want to make a run. As we discuss, XLPR is a, a probabilistic code. That means that you can define the input as deterministic, or you can define them as probabilistic. The way we run this code is a Monte Carlo approach. So it means that once we put the uncertainty in the parameter, we'll have a distribution to define them, we'll sample, and we'll just run the code deterministically as many times as decided by the sample size. In XLPR, any of the input we have from the property tab to the Tiffany tab can be uncertain or deterministic. I will take an example here for the EFPY, which is the effective full power year, which indicates how much of the year you can really use at full power with your uh, power plant. Right now, the data source is set as constant in column E, and the deterministic value in column H, you see highlighted here, is set to 80 meaning that in our theoretical example, we consider that we use the plant at maximum capacity all the time. You may want to change this value. You can do this deterministically, but you also want to change with a distribution. In this case, if you click on the data source, you can select one of the two uncertainty loops we discussed, uh, Matt talked about, which is the epistemic loop and the aleatory loop. As soon as you select one of them, you will see that the deterministic value is now great because it won't be used by the code. But on the side, now you have the probabilistic values that can be defined. And I've highlighted it here. The first part is the distribution type. You select the distribution type, and it represents all the distribution available in GoSIM that are available in XLPR. And in this example, it was normal but you can change to whatever you want as an exponential distribution and so on. Now, one of the things is, depending on which distribution you use, you will have different parameters. In the Excel files, they're defined as parameter one up to parameter eight, which is not very informative. And this is where you can use one of the tab. And if we go to the end and look at the second tab from the right, which is called drop list option. If you click on it, you will have the list of the distribution you can consider and which parameter corresponds to what. For instance, for the normal distribution here, the first parameter is the mean, the second the standard deviation, which is the classical parameter for the normal distribution. And then because you can define this as a truncated, you can also define the minimum and maximum. So, with Excel, you have control to all the inputs you want for the XLPR model. The thing is, when you start to use it, it may be kind of intimidating. Because if you go here for the property, you have a lot of properties. On the loads, on the uh, probability of detection, if you have inspection, and so on. If you go to material property, you also have a lot of 
property. So it's easy to get lost. That's why XLPR is also including the theme editor when it's released. The theme editor is a wrapper around the Excel file that will be able to read the Excel file and to write into the Excel file and give you a more graphical representation. So now I will open an example of simulation here. With the same value, we will do it. Generally, it takes about 20 seconds to open. Uh, during the opening of this, you will see when you run the theme editor that you can open a simulation and just work as if it was your simulation instead of working with Excel, you also have a database access. The database allows you to create a set of data for representative world, also for representative material, and once you have populated this, you can reuse the material properties in a different position, and same thing for the world, so it helps you to create cases a lot faster than initially. So um, once it will be open, we'll see that the structure here is kind of the same as the Excel file, except now it's graphical. You have access to the left pipe, the right pipe, the weld, mitigation. Well, here we only consider an SIP, so we don't have different mitigation material, and the different property like operating condition and so on. For every button here, you have different menu on the side you can click on it. If you want to modify here, it will be kind of the same as with the Excel file. The only difference here is there is a fail safe. Right now we are in view mode, so you cannot change anything. You need to click on edit so you don't change by mistake some value. Once you press edit, you will have access to the data source as we had in the Excel file. I can put this as epistemic now, and you will have a defined distribution. This time, because it's graphical, you have directly the properties here as mean, standard deviation, mean and max, and if I change the distribution, you will have, like for a triangular distribution, the first parameter tells you is it a regular or log triangular distribution, and then you can define the minimum, mod, and maximum. So, up to now, what we have seen is the Excel file that can help you set up the problem or the wrapper, the theme editor that may simplify some of this uh, implementation at the beginning. Once you have set up your problem, you can move to the Excel PR file, and as I say, here it's open for the player version. And the player, all the pro version of Goldsim, will start with this dashboard. Goldsim purpose is to run the code. So the only controls you have is not in the input, the input has been already defined, but just the sample size and the capability to run the code. And this is what this first part at the top does, where you can change the sample size and you can run the code, and then to look at the result and work with the result, which is the bottom part that we will cover just a little later. When you want to run the code, you can select your sample size. So here is a button here on the top left corner where you can select the sample size. Right now it was five. And you can see here in the goal theme run controls that also helps you run. Uh, it says that we have run zero out of the five realization we're still in edit mode. If I go here and I change the number of realization on the first line here to six, then now the sample size will be six and the controller tells us we have zero out of six realization performed. When you want to run the model, you can use a controller with the play button, which is this triangle, or you can click on this icon here, which says run Excel PR model. So whichever you run, it will be the same thing. Uh, the first thing Goldstein will do is take all your information from the Excel file and download into memory. So Goldstream will have up-to-date information of which case you want to run. And this is what it's doing right now with importing the data. It will also download in memory all the DLL and see if you are missing some of the DLL, you will have a message saying, oh, you're missing the DLL, it's not ready. Once Goldstream has everything into memory, and as I say, it should take about 20 seconds, 
then it will start to run the code. And you will see it here in the Goldstein Run controller when it will state that realization one out of six will start. If you move through the controller at this time, you drag, don't click, you will see where you are in the realization. So for instance, when I move the, the mouse, we were just at the beginning with 0 0.79, uh, 75 years. Here, well, the calculation is fast enough, so we don't have time to see, but here we, we can see that we are already on the fifth realization out of six. And after about 30 seconds, the case will be done. So after some export of result, uh, Go team will just give you a message to say, now the run is finished. And you can see some uh, message warning in case there is problem or error. Usually you will have warning message checking some of the value and no fatal error, which means the code has run per perfectly and we don't need to see the warning, so we'll press now. And now, since the code has been run, we can look at the result. Well, the problem we have set up as probability of event around 10 to the minus 3. So it means that it happened once, twice, three times over a thousand case. So if I do just six realizations, we won't see anything. So I have another case now where here we have run it for 10,000 realizations. So here you see the sample size was 10,000, and if you look on the run controller, it says that we have run 10,000 out of the 10,000 realizations. And it took about three hours and 40 minutes here to run these 10,000 realizations. Now, we are not interested anymore with the sampling approach. We want to look at the result option. Since we consider two potential direction, you will have results for the axial crack, which are the top two buttons, and results for circumferential crack, which are the bottom two buttons. Uh, our case didn't have axial crack, so we only look at the circumferential crack. The bottom left button is for the result directly. The bottom right button is the error dashboard to check if everything went well. What we recommend when we use GoldSim is to check first the error. Some of the error will stop GoldSim, and so you know what's going on. Some of the error may still be okay, saying, well, you're out of the bound, but I can still calculate, so the card will calculate. But it's important to see what's going on, because if you have an error like this and you calculate, the result may be meaningless. So we'll go first to the error dashboard. The error dashboard will give you information for all the modules called by GoldSim. As we say, GoldSim is just a wrapper of the XLPR. All the calculations are made in independent modules so they can be replaced in the future for less DLL. And all the input is defined in, within Excel. So for each of the modules, there will be a check to see did the module report reply correctly. And the legend tells you what's going on. A check mark, green check mark, say, okay, no error happened. A warning sign say, okay, there may be some warning. The result may still be okay, but you ought to know this. The stop sign means that one of the modules had a fatal error, and the red flag means you may have multiple error or fatal error. Finally, the gray box means for this realization, nothing happened, we didn't call this module. In this case here, what you see is we have either module not call or check mark. So everything went well, so we're good. We can go back to the global setting to look at the search result, or we can go directly to the circle for short results here. Okay, we have a question here, so I will respond here. What we use here is GoldSim version 11.1, .1, which is not the latest version of GoldSim. Uh, now GoldSim is at the version 12.1. We are doing testing to see if XLPR still works with 12.1, but the official version we use for XLPR is 11.1. .1. 
now, whether you buy the full license of Dolphin or not, you will be able to have access to both the 12 and the 11 version. So, going back to the results, the results dashboard has also two parts. The first part are the general results, and generally they, these are the ones you're interested in risk analysis. These are information on adverse events like a crack occurring, leakage occurring, rupture occurring, or locas, and so on. And these will be presented as statistic probability, just you know, the mean of uh, all the realization, and tells you what's the risk, what's the probability of having such event occurring. The second part is more crack specific results. You can still represent them as statistic, but they may be more informative when you want to look at specific realization and see what's going on. And one of the things of Gold Team is, as uh, Craig mentioned early on, Gold Team saves all the data. So we have access to all 10,000 realization here if we want to look at this. Let's start with the general results here. And the detection effect is probably the most informative uh, output we have because it looks at a variety of values. When you open it for the first time, you will have all these values, which are just occurrences because it's only for one realization, for real realization one. Of course, it's not informative. We discuss about this. We have probability around 10 to the minus 3. If you look at just one out of 10,000 realization, what you will see is mostly zero. So, you will go to the third tab here, which says display realization, and you will move to statistics. If the first time you move, it will take about um, 20 seconds to open. I open it early on, so we can see it here. And here we have direct results from Goldstein. We can look that the probability of having a crack was, we move the mouse here, we'll see it's around two, uh, 10 to the minus 3. The probability of leakage and rupture at 80 years are around 7, 10 to the minus 4. And if we add inspection, leakage goes down to between 1 and 2, 10 to the minus 4. And uh, rupture goes between 6 and 7, 10 to the minus 5. So these are the kind of results you can have with uh, Excel here. In this example, uh, the case run was with MSIP, so this is why the curve start to flatten out around 40 years. Well, these results are just a graphic representation. You may want to use the data and test them and uh, present them with this current code. So you can go to the second uh, icon here on the top, which say, states table, and then you will have a table of results. Once you're in the table of results, you can work as if you were in Excel, select the value, control C, control V, copy in whichever program you want um, to use. Now, these results were kind of averaging risk value. And as we said, you may be interested sometime in looking into um, more details for a particular realization. So I will take here an example of look, looking at the crack evolution with depth and inner left lengths for one realization selected. So once again, realization one gave, gave us nothing, but if I go to rea realization 18, so this time I don't change the display, I just change the number of the realization I want to see. And what you will have is the evolution of a crack for realization 18, a crack occurred. It occurred at time 28, 29 years. It starts to grow up to year 40 when you begin to have the mitigation, the MSIP mitigation, and the depth stop once you have the MSIP mitigation. Because it was probably adding the MSIP into a strongly um, conservative area where suddenly the uh, load and stress were negative and nothing could happen. I can do the same thing with the inner flanks here. 
where you have plot directly uh, the result type realization 18, where you see the same story for the inner half length direction drawing. So the crack starts around 29, 29 years, it grows here, and at 40, it will still grow, but at a slower pace than it used to do uh, before MSIP. So here is kind of a quick demonstration of Excel PR, how it works, where you use Excel to set up your problem, use Goldstream to run your problem and have access to the output and you can extract the output. Now, you may be only interested to use XRPI as this as running and looking at the results. You may also be interested in looking at the model. And well, if you have the full version of Goldstream, you will have access to the full model and you can change whatever you want. If you have the player version, you cannot change the model, but you can still look at the model. If we go to the Goldstream run controller here, and you look at the last button, and you click on the button, you will be able to navigate through the model. There is an option which is navigation, and you can go to any dashboard we have look, but you can also go to the model route and see the structure of Goldstein. In this structure, you will have the classical view of an object-oriented program where you have the object defined and some container where you can put the object and the link between objects. Uh, we won't cover this now because it's a huge model with many layers. The only thing I want to show you, and I will move quickly here, I apologize, is that we have the same structures that Matt presented previously for the crack evolution. In our Gaussian model, we have the same module with crack initiation, then crack growth, then the possibility of coalescence for circumferential crack, where transition from a surface crack to a swirl crack, the stability that can lead to leakage or that can lead to pipe rupture. And if you have a swirl crack, you can calculate the crack opening displacement, then the leak rate. And finally, you can also estimate the probability of detecting a crack with in-service inspection. So all this structure is available for view, and you can look at every element and see what the value of this element was at any time and at any, for any realization. Okay, so let's go back now to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So we have looked at how we can run and look at results. Now, this is kind of the result we have after we extracted the value. Um, here, we have the impact of inspection and the impact of MSIP outline. If you look at the blue and the red curve, which are leak and rupture, and compared to the green and yellow curve, which are the same probability, but with in-service inspection, you can see that inspection gave us about one order of magnitude for leakage and two order of magnitude for rupture if you apply inspection. Now, the effect of MSIP is seen when you look at the curve of the same color. The plain line is without MSIP and the dashed line is with MSIP applied at 40 years. And you can see here that the crack initiation becomes almost flat once you reach MSIP. And it's the same thing with a small lag uh, for leakage rupture. And the only difference with MSIP was a difference in the uh, WRS profile. And you can see here the difference in WRS profile. You have also the um, reason why the other crack stopped because we were in a strongly conservative zone uh, for realization 18, so it stopped growing through the depth. Now, XRPR has a certain number of output, as we said, that we can use directly, but it's not limited to this output. You can find intermediate results and make some 
additional analysis. And as we said at the beginning, we will demonstrate this for LDB application. So the current LDB procedure follow the NRC standard review plan section 363. The way it works is you estimate the track size required to have a 10 gallon per minute leak rate. You estimate the critical track size that will lead to part rupture. And then you can calculate a ratio between critical crack size and leak crack size. And the acceptance criteria is set as this ratio equal to. So if you have a ratio greater than two, it's acceptable. This procedure is deterministic and static. Deterministic because we just use one value, static because we don't need to grow the crack. We just need to calculate these two values. Uncertainty is not ignored here. It's considered, but it's represented with conservatism. One of the conservatism is on the first bullet. We use a 10 gallon per minute leak rate, which is 10 times the expected detectable leak rate of one GPM. The second one is use an acceptance criteria at row equal two instead of one, giving us even more margin. So if we want to move this to the probabilistic RBB, what do we do? Well, the first thing is, why do we want to do this? Well, the reason is the standard review plan was not applicable if there is a negative degradation mechanism such as PWSCC. So that was the driving factor of going to a risk-based framework. And since it has been developed, we have an increase in knowledge, but also in computer capabilities. So we can do dynamic codes now, we can do probabilistic fracture mechanics, and we can include more mechanism such as surface crack structure, impact of axial crack, effect of mitigation, inspection, and so on. And one of the reasons we want to do the probabilistic approach is it can help us reduce the conservatism to go to a more realistic analysis. And this is what we'll see in this next slide, where uh, we calculate the LBV ratio probabilistically. So for this case, we had to run a larger sample size, 100,000 runs, because not all runs give you a rupture. But since we have a larger sample size, we can estimate this LBV ratio exactly the same way uh, for each realization. And once we have a set of realization with LBV ratio, we can sort them and create a distribution. We can do this for 10 GPM, and that's uh, orange curve here, and we can do this for one GPM, which is a red curve. Our criter criterion threshold here of two is circle in blue, and this is our limit. We don't want to go below. What we see is in both cases, we are okay, but the difference is if you use the conservative 10 GPM ratio, your ratio vary between four and six with an average of around 4.4, 4.5. If you use a more realistic bond GPM, your ratio vary between 8 and 12 and with an average of around 10. So this result quantified how the conservatism can affect the answer. In this case, everything was okay, but in other case, you may be below the limit with 10 GPM and above the limit with one GPM. One of the things here of XLPR is, as we said, this LBB is not a direct result from XLPR. So to extract this, we needed to do some post-processing of XLPR. So now I will let my colleague, Marcus Burkhardt from DEI to talk to you a little more of what can be done when it's not a direct result from XLPR, but you can still have access to it and what you can do. Thanks, Cedric. Um, so Cedric touched on a few outputs that we considered in the collaborative NRC and EPRI piping system analyses that were not default outputs directly calculated with an XLPR. And so those included the LBB ratio, which is the ratio between the critical crack size and the crack size of a given leak rate, as well as the time between a given leak rate and a rupture. So rather than modifying the XLPR source code for these piping system analyses, it was decided to perform the needed post processing outside of XLPR. So additionally, um, performing post-processing allowed us to combine results for multiple runs 
uh, increasing the total number of realizations that could be considered in an individual analysis case, and also allowing us to evaluate uh, lower probability events. Next slide. So how did we do this? We developed a third-party software in Python to help automate the data extraction and post-processing. And that was broken into two different scripts. Uh, the first utilized an open source Python package called PyAutoGUI. And this was used to automate extraction of data from XLPR for every single realization um, for multiple outputs, uh, both, both final outputs and also intermediate values calculated in XLPR and it saved those text files for post-processing. Uh, the second script was then used to perform computations and to develop statistics for, for several outputs of interest, including default outputs, um, such as the time to rupture, as well as non-default outputs calculated from intermediate values, uh, such as the LBB ratio or the time from to rupture. So this is just an example of showing you, you know, that it's possible to access intermediate values and also calculate additional outputs in addition to those provided uh, in XLPR by default. Uh, back to you, Cedric. Thank you, Marcus. So to, to conclude this demonstration, what we have shown you is XLP uh, was developed to be flexible and applicable to different problems. You have a large number of outputs directly available, such as probability of first crack, first leak, rupture, uh, locus, where you can define the locus. You have also additional output that are available via intermediate results, and you can extract them with third-party software or with some simple change of the code. The point is everything is safe, so it makes this kind of huge find. That's why sometimes we have to run separate files, but everything is safe in those things, so we can access to everything whenever we want. Now, this uh, demonstration was done for LBB um, case. But XLPR is not limited to LBB, and we can use for a variety of different problems that we study. And now I will let my colleague Nathan Glantz from EPRI to talk about potential application of XLPR. Nathan? Thank you, Cedric. Um, now that everyone's seen a little bit about how the code works, uh, I'm going to just very, very briefly discuss where we think XLPR could go next. You know, remember, this is just the start of XLPR, so you'll be hearing a lot more about it in the future. But um, as you heard, the initial focus was on leak before break issues that are associated with uh, primary water stress corrosion cracking into similar metal welds. But as Cedric just said, I want to point out again, XLPR is not a leak before break code. XLPR is a probabilistic fracture mechanics code. Um, it was designed with a modular structure and a flexibility to consider almost every single variable as distributed. Um, and so there are already cases where we're looking into where else we can use this code beyond um, leak before break as the code already is. And then we're also looking at how we can exercise that flexibility um, from the modular structure to, to take the problems beyond XLPR or beyond leak before break as well, excuse me. So the first and most obvious use of XLPR that we can see is how we can optimize inspections um, and repair replacement strategies. So as, as you've heard a lot about already, XLPR can take care of both uh, primary water stress corrosion cracking and the fatigue degradation mechanisms. Not only that, but you can also model in your mitigation. Um, so that's also key. So, you know, right now it's set up excellently for, for piping welds, butt welds. But the modular structure lends itself well to expanding the use to different geometries. So this is something we're going to keep keep pursuing. Um, beyond that, if you go big picture, you know you can look at redefining design basis break size. You know this is this is a big question to ask, but if if we can use XLPR to prove that the probability of rupture for a large break, loss of coolant accident, so large break loca, was was indeed extremely low. Um, and you can combine that with PRA insights for a consequence analysis. Can, can we possibly change the manner in which we evaluate large break loca, um, especially as the double into guillotine break? So this is just just a big thought. You know, uh, it's a big problem. It could have a lot of benefits. You know, reduced EQ impacts, increased containment structural margins, increased safety, safety system response time margins. 
you know, this is something we, you know, love to look at. This is a long-term project. So um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to licensing of high burn up, high enrichment uh, core designs, we have new fuel out there. So we want to see if we can use XLPR um, and the insights about the probability of rupture that can be gained from the code um, to, to see how we can apply it to that new fuel. Um, high energy line break population, you know, it's just some ongoing work already. You know, for class one components especially, the, the postulation of intermediate line break locations is, is based on uh, stress limits or cumulative usage uh, factor for fatigue limits. Um, can XLPR be used to, to either, you know, provide us some insight into a better way of doing this or improve the way we evaluate high energy line breaks? And finally, the last bullet I have here is balance of plant system, so BOP. You know, we know BOP is important. Can we use XLPR to um, look at local frequencies and could that project on how we design, maintain, inspect those BOP systems? But not only that, could we actually apply XLPR to certain BOP systems that are affected um, by fatigue um, to lend itself to how we inspect those systems or how we design those systems? So this is very, very brief rundown. I just want to make sure everyone's aware that, you know, this is the first step in XLPR. There's going to be a lot more coming in the future, so stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric and Nate and Marcus, uh, for the excellent presentation. Um, now we're going to go to a topic uh, Craig's going to introduce here, which you've probably all been waiting for. This is how are you going to be able to get a copy of the code? referred several times let me see did I am I unmuted yes Craig you are we can hear you okay thank you I'm, I'm sorry I forgot to do that uh, we've we've referred several times to having developed the code within a software quality assurance environment and the resulting extensive documentary record uh, for context, now, when we refer to XLPR, we are broadly referring to the software elements, both the source and executable elements, the user manual, input databases, project summary technical reports, training materials, and the software quality assurance records. So, many elements when we when we make this general reference to XLPR. So to be more specific, our initial priority is for potential users to have ready access to the code in order to become familiar with its capabilities and the potential applications. Therefore, this initial public release will f include the executable software elements that are necessary to set up and run the code, the user manual, specific input databases, a series of supporting summary technical reports and various training resources. And for a portion of the prospective user community, it's likely that this will be all the information that is needed. Other users will require access to the QA pedigree, detailed documentary records, 
to support their use of the code in a nuclear QA environment. For XLPR, this constitutes in excess of 100 individual documents, several thousand pages, as well as, of course, the source code elements of the software. Management of a nuclear QA pedigreed code requires rigorous maintenance of these supporting QA artifacts and a degree of ongoing two-way interaction with the user community. Therefore, we plan to provide access to this full set of documentation that constitutes the XLPR QA pedigree through membership in an XLPR user group. Uh, we will provide additional details regarding the establishment of this user group in coming months. So right now we're focused on this, the top half of this slide, what's uh, being used in this initial public release. The USNRC and EPRI have jointly agreed to an initial distribution plan that allows for distribution to U.S. domestic entities and individuals, as well as to in entities and individuals in a specific list of approved countries. These criteria are summarized on this slide, but will be more explicitly stated within the end-user license agreement that all applicants will be required to review and accept prior to be at granting, granted access to the code. The list of approved destinations presently includes this set of 32 countries. Requests from entities or for citizens from non-listed countries uh, will require further review and will therefore be handled by exception. So if your country is not listed here, that's, that doesn't mean that you can't get the code, but it will have to be uh, considered separately. So distribution of the XOPR code is being managed through the EPRI distribution process, and it will be accessible starting from either nrc.gov or from epri.com, from our respective home pages of the two organizations. If you're starting from nrc.gov, you would uh, navigate to the computer codes page, and that will provide relevant information about XLPR, as well as uh, having a link to the XLPR v2.1 abstract page on epri.com. Likewise, if you start from epri.com, um, navigating to the abstract page involves just uh, a simple search. And I'll, I'll show a little bit more of both of those paths in the next slides. Uh, once you get to the on the epri.com, the epri the XLPR v2.1 release abstract page uh, will provide additional pertinent information about uh, how to proceed. Your request will be screened, and if the applicant uh, meets the access criteria. They will be presented an end-user license agreement to read and agree to. By accepting its terms and conditions, the applicant will be attesting that they and any other end-user meet the XLPR access requirements that are explicitly stated in that um, license agreement. The applicant will then receive an email containing further instructions of how to access the uh, release package via a secure FTP site. Now, all these necessary links and web pages are not yet in place, so you'll have to be patient with us a little bit longer. Uh, 
we're working on getting all that in place. Uh, but the following example kind of show you how this process should flow. If you start from nrc.gov, if you've been here before, you're familiar with this uh, tab of, of options across the near top. And under the About NRC tab, there's a couple of ways you can navigate from there, a drop-down list or from this list on the left-hand side. Go to the Research section. You'll see this display of, uh, of research activities, and in particular, for our interests, the items of computer codes that provide general information, and then obtaining the codes of how to access uh, the various codes listed, including XLPR v2.1, which will be uh, added there soon. This will take you then to the, uh, the abstract page where you'll find the instructions to actually initiate the process. If you start from EPRI.com, the process will, will be not terribly different. Uh, I will point out that if you go to EPRI.com right now, it does not quite look like this. As it happens, this coming month, we will be uh, rolling out a, a different look to the EPRI.com homepage and as well as subsequent screens. So uh, I've tried to reflect what that should look like later in May uh, in, in these examples. Uh, you'll find a uh, search icon in the upper right corner of the epi.com homepage. If you select that icon, it will open this uh, search feature, and you can you can type in the product ID when that's available to you. You can just type in XLPR and search. Uh, that will take you to a results page. And this obviously is not an XLPR results page, but it's what was shown in the, de the beta version that we have available right now. Uh, so you would, from the, the uh, search results, XLPR v.1 should be listed at the top and uh, readily available for you to select. That would take you to the XLPR v2.1 abstract page. And again, this is clearly not that. Uh, we do not have that posted yet. This is just an example of roughly what it will look like. Um, it would identify information about the code, the release package, and in a box in this general area, we'll have additional instructions for how to uh, request the code. And that will require that you provide basic information. And uh, of course, as noted before, that will be quickly vetted. You'll get a response with the uh, end user license agreement and, and subsequent steps. So when will the uh, XLPR code be released? We are in a final testing at this point. We've just completed several maintenance actions uh, including verification of the software, but now it is uh, undergoing some independent functionality and usability testing. We are continuing to complete the necessary updates to key pieces of documentation and the training materials. And uh, at this point, with a clear line of sight to completion of all of those remaining tasks, we have set the distribution date is uh, May 28th of 2020. XLPR runs are computationally intensive and run times can easily extend into hours. While a wide range of hardware platforms can run XLPR, Clearly, as and this is no surprise to anyone on this call, more capable platforms certainly will offer uh, runtime advantages. GoldSim is a Windows-based environment. 
and XLPR 2.1 has been uh, tested in Windows version 10. The M spreadsheet, as Cedric uh, uh, displayed, is an Excel spreadsheet, and so you need a current version of Excel. We have uh, we have been testing version 2.1 with Excel 365. XLPR framework is a GoldSim model. The model files for both the GoldSim player version as well as the GoldSim pro version will be provided in the release package. However, each user must uh, obtain their own copy of either the GoldSim player or GoldSim pro. Uh, the player can be downloaded from the GoldSim website at no cost, but user flexibility in exercising the features of XLPR is more limited. GoldSim Pro has a fee-based license, but it will allow the user to access all features of XLPR. And it's important to note, once again, as Cedric pointed out, that XLPR was developed and fully tested with an earlier version of GoldSim, and presently it is not forward compatible with the latest available version uh, from, from GoldSim. So as noted here on the slide, uh, it's uh, GoldSim 11.1.7 that, uh, that is compatible with XLPR. In addition, to the training resources that will be included with the release package. We do plan a series of several focused informational webinars in conjunction with the distribution go live date that are intended to complement the training materials in the release package. And Matt will cover that in a little bit more detail shortly. And finally, uh, watch for announcements later in the year regarding formation of the XLPR users group. And with that, I will hand it back to Matt. All right, Craig, thank you very much for telling everybody how to get a copy of the code. Uh, so I will uh, go ahead and, and take us uh, to the end of the presentation here. And I want to just uh, talk a little bit about some other um, training that we're going to be doing in the future here. Uh, this was a, a, a general session today just to provide some information about the code, um, things like that. But we have some other opportunities available where you'll be able to learn more about the technical details. Okay, so um, we're going to hold a technical seminar on June 3rd. That's right around uh, release time of the code. And then we'll get more into detail about the different models that are in XLPR and um, those kind of te technical aspects there um, and how the code operates uh, together with all those modules. And then after that, we'll have uh, some additional user sessions planned every two weeks. And the format of these will be to demonstrate some of the key features of the code, uh, provide some hints and tips, and then also to devote uh, a good portion of the time I'm to interacting with users and helping them use the code and answer any questions that they may have. The first of those uh, will be on setting up the inputs. We're looking at the week of June 15th for that one. Uh, there we may cover um, some of the simulation options, uh, setting distribution types and things like that. Uh, the next one would be on actual running the simulation slated for week of June 29th. We'll talk about you know running GoldSim, um, working with the global settings dashboard, 
sampling options, um, errors, and debugging. And then the, the next one will be uh, accessing the results for the week of July 13th. And we'll talk about you know, navigating the results menus that Cedric showed us, some of the uh, default uh, results, and as well as getting uh, other information out of the code. These are going to be great opportunities to get involved more with learning about the code and using it. I definitely highly encourage you to participate, and we'll have some announcements on those uh, coming out after this meeting. Okay, uh, we had uh, slated some time for at the end here for questions and answers, and uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, however, we have been responding to, I think, as many uh, questions as we have capacity for in the chat here. Uh, as mentioned, we will uh, take a copy of the chat and we will respond to uh, the questions in the NRC meeting summary that's put out. So with that, I'm going to move on to deliver a uh, closed meeting. So what we've done today is presented you with XLPR version 2 code as a state-of-the-art tool for piping integrity risk assessment and a code that's developed and vetted by leading experts from government and industry. It's built using modern software design concept under a robust quality assurance program. And it's also a code that is transparent and flexible. We are very much looking forward to having you become part of the XLPR community. Please mark your calendars for that May 28th release date and also look for the future announcements, like I said, on the additional training webinars. Greg, did you have anything else uh, you wanted to add here at the end? No, Matt, I think uh, we've, we've covered uh, plenty of information for today. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for their time today and, and joining us. Hopefully everyone is, and their families are staying safe and healthy. After the meeting ends, uh, Whoever wants to provide feedback, uh, welcome to do so. We'd like to understand your views about this meeting and potentially improve future NRC meetings as well. And if you'd care to provide feedback, um, go to nrc.gov, uh, click on the public meeting schedule. Like show recently held meetings, uh, find this meeting, and then you can click and uh, there'll be a meeting feedback form displayed electronically that you can fill out and submit. Uh, just a reminder, Again, we'll be issuing a public meeting summary for this. And we'll be making video recording of this seminar available as well. And finally, we have set up XLPR at nrc.gov and xlpr at epri.com so you can communicate with us. Greg and I monitor those email addresses. So if you have any questions at all, you can go ahead and use those resources to reach out to us. Once again, uh, I want to thank everybody, and I will look forward to seeing you and uh, interacting with you more. Uh, some of our future events. Thank you very much.